Welcome back to Student of the Gun Radio. I am your host, Paul Markle. And, of course, with me in the Student of the Gun studios is Jared. He's on the other side of the board. He's working hard this morning. Now, uh, we want to make sure that we thank our friends at Firearms Radio Network, and we want to tell you guys uh, uh, some news or make sure that you're aware of the news. Uh, we've added another show to the Firearms Radio Network. Uh, our good friends, Braden Gunn and Glenn Kinman of the Big and Wild Outdoors. That's right. Big and Wild Outdoors is now a part of the Firearms Radio Network, and we want to uh, take a moment to welcome them to the network. You just go to firearmsradio.tv and click on the link. You can listen to their new shows. Now, also, we want to thank our good friends at Crossbreed Holsters of Liberty, Missouri, and, of course, Keltec Firearms of Cocoa, Florida. Now, this week, uh, Jared and I got out to the range, and uh, we did some filming for the TV show portion with the new KSG. Well, I guess it's not new. It's been out for about, what, three years or so. But uh, we did some filming for, with the KSG-12 shotgun. So pay attention. That will be coming up very, very soon. Matter of fact, I believe, Jared, is it going to be next week's episode? So, yeah, make sure that you're checking out Student of the Gun TV. Just go to studentofthegun.com. You can watch the uh, all the episodes right there on the main screen. So if you want to uh, take a look at the KSG shotgun, uh, see it in action, you can do that. That will be on Tuesday, the 28th of May. Okay, so that episode will premiere uh, the 28th of May. Now, I hope you guys enjoyed that lanyap that we did for you. Now, down here on the Gulf Coast, a lanyap means a little something extra. That's right. We did some bonus material this week. Uh, My First Gun, the My First Gun special episode or special edition of Student of the Gun Radio. Now, if you are the designated gun guy whether it's in your office or you're the designated gun guy in your family. You're the guy that when, you know, novices and new people, when they're thinking about buying a gun, they come to you. They're like, hey, you know, should I get a this or should I get a that or what have you? And sometimes you might not you think uh, <laughs> know what to tell them. So what we did is we uh, did an entire bonus episode for you guys called My First Gun. So all you've got to do uh, is steer your friends towards that, steer your relatives, say, hey, go listen to this. Or you can listen to that and then just mimic me and give them that advice, whatever works for you. So uh, if you haven't checked it out yet, it's a bonus material called My First Gun, and it's on uh, on the website, so just check it out. Now, don't forget Student of the Gun gear. You can get the books, the DVDs, lots of cool stuff. Uh, we've got the new Pocket Lifesaver. So if you're in the market for some educational material or you just want to tell the world that you are indeed a student of the gun. Well, guess what? You can go to the student of the gun gear. You can buy an official shirt. But if you don't feel like putting the coin out and you want to just roll the dice, what you can do is you can keep writing in and hope that you get picked to be the student of the week. Now, Jared, go ahead and tell us who the student of the week is and what was their question. Our student of the week is Steve Alexander, and he wants to know, with the recent tornado in Oklahoma, what steps could he take to better prepare himself and his family? Steve, that's a fantastic question, and I think it's something that's on a lot of people's minds today. You know, ever since 9-11, since Hurricane Katrina, since the uh, Joplin tornadoes, people have been asking themselves, what can I do to better prepare myself or to start preparing myself? If you haven't started yet, you're way behind the curve, and so get to it. But uh, even if you have, you say, well... You know, do I have enough? And, and you know, you, you might have enough, but what you need to do is really, you know, it, it's 2013 and everybody's got iPhones or smartphones and they've got Netflix and Xboxes and all that cool stuff. But turn the lights out for 24 hours and see what happens. People kind of revert back to caveman uh, days. And what you need to ask yourself or you need to refer back to is what we, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. What do human beings absolutely have to have? Well, number one, you got to have clean water. Doesn't matter how much, you know, food, guns, ammo, fuel, gasoline, batteries, flashlights, all that stuff. If you don't have clean water to drink, you're going to be hurting. And it's not going to take very long for you to be hurting. So, number one, do we have clean water to drink? You know, if, if you walked over to the tap and you turned the, the uh, spigot on and nothing came out, 
what would you do? Would you be okay? Uh, you know, if, if uh, you had no clean water coming out of your faucets for a day, two days, three days, would you be good to go? Or would your family suffer? Then after you, you know, after you deal with that, then you say, obviously food. Uh, you, the human body needs energy to survive, especially during a crisis situation. If you're outside, you know, in, <laughs> a lot of people live very, very comfortable lives. And then after a disaster, whether it's man-made or natural, they they find themselves doing things that they don't normally do. They're outside clearing brush, debris, uh, or just the fact that they have no utilities makes life more difficult. You need energy. You need good food. And uh, peanut butter crackers are nice, but you need more than that. Your body needs more than just a bunch of peanut butter crackers and beef jerky. So take care of the, the clean water. Make sure you've got plenty of that food. And then, of course... It is as ugly as it is. You need to understand that a crisis. Um, Katrina was. I was. I was down there. And I don't know if you. If we've talked about it on the show before, but I was uh, actually down uh, in New Orleans uh, right after the levees broke uh, during hur- Hurricane Katrina, and what I saw was the both the absolute best in people and the absolute worst in people. And that's what you'll have after a a crisis or a disaster. You know, the people that are bad become extra bad, and people that are good, you know, the best comes out in them. We saw people volunteer. People were staying up, you know, 24 hours uh, without rest or sleep so they could help their neighbors. People volunteered. You know, folks got in their cars, EMTs and firemen and police officers and Red Cross volunteers and what have you. I mean, they got in their cars and they drove 24 hours nonstop so they could get down to New Orleans to start helping people. So you've got that. But then you also have the creatures that devolve into an animal state and try to take advantage of their fellow man. And let me tell you what, I have no mercy or pity for anyone that does that. As far as I'm concerned, during a, you know, a, a civil crisis or a uh, post disaster situation, if your first thought is how can I take advantage of my fellow man? How can I steal from my fellow man? How can I abuse my fellow man? You have sunk to the level of an animal and we just, we just cannot tolerate that. So how do you protect your family? You say, I've got food. I got water, we got a generator, I got batteries and flashlights, I've got all that stuff. If you don't have something to protect it with, some bad person is just going to come and take it away from you. And I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. And if your entire defensive plan is to call 911, you're going to be hurting. Because all I, mean, I can tell you this, in a, in a crisis situation, in a disaster, the state police and your local sheriff – police department, they're going to have their hands full, especially if you live in or around a metropolitan area. They're going to be so busy taking care of the downtown area, which is currently being looted, that they're not going to have the ability, even though they may want to, they're not going to have the ability to come running out to your house to drive away the uh, the intruders or the looters. You're going to have to do it yourself. Now, what is the best way to get a human being, a human predator, to stop misbehaving? a rifle or a shotgun. That's just, um, that's it. If you don't have a self-loading rifle or a shotgun, I would go with a self-loading rifle first and then a shotgun second. Uh, everyone's like, oh, shotguns are intimidating, all that. Yeah, okay, they are. But you have to think about it. It's not just you. It's your wife. It's your teenagers. It's, you know, other people. Can everyone in the clan operate that hardware? And you need to, and quite frankly, an AR-15 is probably the A number one best personal defense gun for everyone in the family to use. So check off your list. You know, you, you, I, do we have water? Check. Food? Check. Okay. And then a lot of other stuff. Well, are you going to buy a generator? Are you just going to buy batteries? Are you just going to rely on chem lights? You know, do you have a barbecue grill that has propane tanks? You know, what have you got? And then make sure that you've got something to protect it with. Now, here at Student of the Gun, we actually were just recently introduced to a really cool product, a product that is designed to take 
pond water, river water, you know, lake water, any kind of a water source uh, and turn it into drinking water. What we're doing right now is we were so impressed by this product that we're actually going to be working with the manufacturer to bring it to you guys. So keep a, a sharp eye out or a sharp ear out for uh, the new product. And it's going to be launching. What do we got? Two weeks, Jared? Give me the fingers. Yep. Jared's giving me the fingers. He says two weeks. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you folks saw this, but this next story comes out of California. That's right. The People's Republic of California. And it's from our source is the Washington Times dot com. And as I pull it up on my super cool monitor here. All right. Uh, it's an editorial. Uh, in the Washington Times dot com. And it says one law for us and another for you. And essentially the gist of the story is this, is that California State Senate voted on this previous Wednesday, uh, 28 to 8, to exempt itself from currently existing or new gun laws in the state of California. So what does that tell you? If you live a, if you live in California and you don't believe that you're in an occupied state or that it's an us versus them situation, uh, does this open your eyes? Your legislators have decided that the laws that they put on you don't need to apply to them. Does that smack of ruling class? I don't know. Ask yourself that. Do you believe that they are lords and ladies, dukes and duchesses, uh, and that they are the ruling class and you are the peasantry? Well, you peasants, you peasants can't be trusted to own those kind of mean, evil, nasty guns. But we ruling class elitists, we're good to go. We can have them because we can be trusted. So I, I'm. It, that is an insult to every uh, adult American in the United States. It, it, I don't know how we live in a nation where we have elected public servants. That's right. Elected public servants, not kings and queens, who can just exempt themselves from the laws that they apply to you. Do you think, you know, look yourself in the mirror, talk to your friends. Do you think that the people that you send to your state capital, to Washington, D.C., do you think that the first thing they should do when they pass a law is exempt themselves from that law? Uh, I don't think so. But, you know, ask that question for yourself. Moving on, the next one. Now, this next one is, man, I tell you what, it's it's disturbing. It's – and – it makes it really makes me things that make you go hmm. All right, well, it, this story comes out of Oregon, and uh, but it was reported by the Daily Mail. Co. Uk. That's right, a United Kingdom newspaper or an online paper. Woman choked and raped by her ex boyfriend after dispatcher informs her there are no cops to help, and instead tells her to ask the attacker to leave. Yes, you read that right. And I read, when I first heard about this story, I thought, nah, it's it's a spoof. It's it's not right. And then I researched it, and I said, well, unless somebody is really creative and came up with a total fabrication, this is what happened. It was a domestic violence or a domestic dispute where a you know, psycho ex-boyfriend has been stalking his ex-girlfriend. And according to the report, this woman had actually just been in the hospital a week prior because psycho ex-boyfriend had beat her up and put her there. Well, now she's at home. He's found her. He's beaten on the door. He's trying to get into the house. She tells him, go away, leave, leave. I'm calling the police. He doesn't care. Uh, and again, according to the story, there's already an arrest warrant out for this guy. So she gets on the phone. She calls 911. The first dispatcher tells you, I have no one available. Let me transfer you to the state police. So they transfer her to the state police. And the state police tell her the same thing. We have no one available to come out there. And they said, <laughs> why don't you ask him to leave. Yep. Ask the the guy, ask your attacker to leave. Make sure you say please when you ask your attacker to leave. But uh, and so what happened? Well, she's on the phone with the uh, 911 and they're like, you know, tell him you're tell him you called the police. I did. Tell him to leave. 
Um, yeah, I did. He's not leaving. Well, he, the guy eventually ends up breaking into the house and he chokes and rapes his ex girlfriend while she's on the phone with 911. And uh, all of the, there's people have been on the internet about this and they're outraged and they're angry and they're upset. And it, I've seen a lot of the comments. People are like, well, they need more money. And, in, you know, it's like, well, because of the budget cuts or because of they don't have it. Well, stop yourself. And they're angry at the police. They're angry at the sheriff's department and so forth. Well, what it comes down to is this, folks. It doesn't matter how much money is in the budget. There's never going to be enough money to park a sheriff's deputy at the end of your driveway 24 hours a day to guard your house. You know, folks are angry at the police. They're angry at the state. But from a, uh, you know, a practical, actually, and a legal standpoint, the state, as represented by police and, uh, you know, the state police, the sheriff's department, and so forth, the state does not have a duty to protect you as an individual. Now you say, whoa, 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 no, police have to protect you. No, they have a duty to protect you as a whole not as an individual. Think about it like this. You uh, get up in the morning, you walk out, and you find that, find that your car was stolen during the night. Can you sue the police department for, for, for uh, not preventing that from happening? Well, no, obviously you can't. Well, why not? Because they don't have a duty to protect you as an individual. They have a duty to protect the community as a whole, as a collective But, uh, you know, if someone breaks into your house, you can't sue the sheriff's department because you had a break in. It doesn't work like that. The only time you can get them for dereliction of duty is if they were actually present and did nothing. Now, no cop in America is going to be present and do nothing. But here's the deal. They can't be everywhere at once. When I read this story, it was very, very easy for me to believe because... When I was a cop, I used to have to deal with domestic violence, you know, situations, you know, post and during and after and what have you. And I remember one specific instance where uh, I got called to a, a residence and the woman had, a, you know, a crazy ex-husband or ex-boyfriend. I can't remember which, but and he didn't live in the, our jurisdiction anymore. He lived somewhere else, but he had called her and threatened her over the phone. So she wanted to file a complaint. Okay, great. Go to the house. I take the complaint. Get my clipboard out. and like, okay, when did it happen? What happened? What did he say? And so forth. And as a cop, I can tell you it's it's a mess. When you have people, a person in one jurisdiction making a threatening phone call to someone in another jurisdiction, it's, it's a jurisdictional nightmare because I can't drive from my city to somebody else's city. It Anyway, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a pain in the rump. Uh, but what I asked her was, I said, well, she said, I'm, I'm afraid he's going to come here. Okay. Uh, you know, do you have good locks? Do you have a dog? No, I don't have a dog. Okay. And, and I asked her what I thought was a reasonable question. I said, well, do you have a gun? And uh, she said, no, guns make me uncomfortable. All right. So here I am standing in your kitchen. You're telling me how you are deathly afraid of your ex-husband, ex-boyfriend, whatever he is, and that you are afraid that he's going to come to your house and hurt you. Yes. And and in the same sentence, you're telling me that guns make you uncomfortable. Well, if I'm on duty and I'm around and this guy shows up, I will come over. But guess what? I can't be here. All day, every day. Police officers are not your private bodyguards. They cannot come to your house and just hang out waiting for bad stuff to happen. They have other things to do. You know, you they may be involved in, uh, in there's some police agencies in some jurisdictions that all they do is go from call to call to call all night long. And they don't have time to sit at your house. And this, the person in question here, the woman that I'm talking about, she was not an invalid. She was not, she was a physically fit adult woman. She could have legitimately gone out and purchased a firearm quite legally, gotten some training and kept it in the house as an emergency tool just in case. But her emergency tool was the phone. 
Her solution was, if I ever have a problem, I'm going to get on the phone, and I'm going to call you, and you're going to come solve my problem for me. That is not the real world. It's that, you know, that's fantasy land. Even if, you know, every cop in America wanted to be at your house protecting you, they can't do it. 911 is not there to magically solve all your problems. 911 is to get help on the way. The big question is, what do you do between dialing 911 and the, the arrival of whoever it happens to be, police, ambulance, fire, or what have you? If your whole plan is call 911, sit down on the floor and wait, you're going to be in trouble. And as this woman in Oregon learned, you know, and you, and you say to yourself, as a reasonable person, I know a lot of you guys out there in the audience, guys and girls, you're thinking, what is this person crazy? This guy beats her up, puts her in the hospital. She gets out of the hospital, goes home, and she doesn't have any kind of a tool to defend herself against crazy ex-boyfriend. What are you waiting for? And I mean, everybody's got to live their own life. And if you are a person who doesn't believe in guns, well, first of all, if you don't believe in guns, I don't think you're listening to my show right now, but you guys probably know people that will tell you that everybody does. Everyone has the, you know, the, the aunt or the friend at work or the, you know, acquaintance that tells them, I don't believe in guns. Hey, rock on, you know, that's cool. And I'm sure that the person who's going to rape you will be really, really happy that you don't believe in guns. Now, when it comes to getting, let, let's say, let's take a, a, uh, a little bit of a right turn here and let's talk about getting women involved in shooting or introducing them to guns. Now, it doesn't have to be a rape instance or, you know, uh, an assault instance. It could just be, I want to get my my wife, my teenage daughter, my girlfriend, you know, whoever. I want to get them involved in shooting. I want them to enjoy it because if, if it's, women are different than men, obviously, mentally. And it, that's not either a good or a bad thing. It just is. And they're different. Well, if you want a woman to get involved in the shooting sports and to practice and, you know, train, practice and enjoy it, it has to be an enjoyable experience for them. If it's a drudgery, if they're only doing it because you drug them to the range, you put the gun in their hand and you said, now shoot it, honey. Yeah, they'll do it. They'll do it because they're trying to like just shut you up or make you happy, but they're not going to enjoy it. You want them to actually desire to go to the range, that you want them to do it on their own. And how do we do that? Well, one of the ways is we make it fun for them by making the gun or guns their own. Let them pick out what they want. Let them try out different things. And then when they decide, hey, I really want one of those, whatever it happens to be, let them customize it however they want to customize it. Now you say, well, what do you mean? The most simple customization that you can do for your wife, girlfriend, your daughter, what have you, is put some color on it. Now, there are women out there, and I'm sure they're in the audience, there's like, no, that's bull crap. I want my gun to be black, just like it came from the, you know, from the factory. Okay, great. You know, drive on. Uh, but a lot of ladies out there like colors. Colors are fun. You know, it doesn't have to be a drudgery. This doesn't have to be something that's like super hardcore serious because you can kill somebody just as dead with a pink gun as you can with a black gun. Uh, trust me on that. And uh, from a, a personal standpoint, I did that very thing uh, for my my daughter, my daughter who's now 18 years old. She wanted to start shooting uh, action pistol. So what I did is I got a uh, Glock Model 17 for her. Uh, she liked it, and I said, "Well, what do you, what do you want? What color do you want it to be?" <laughs> and I actually pulled out the the Duracoat. If you guys know Duracoat, they do all kinds. I mean, every color under the sun. I, I, I can't think of a color that Duracoat doesn't have available to put on a gun as a, as a gun finish. Can you, Jared? I, I don't know. I think they pretty much have just about every color under the rainbow. And, uh, and they have all types of different color patterns and so forth. So anyway, I gave my daughter, I gave her the, uh, the catalog. I said, pick out a pattern. You know, what do you want? And she picked out the Lady Amstripe. Now, they have a pattern called Amstripe, and it's kind of like a green tiger, like that old Vietnam-era tiger stripe. Well, the Lady Amstripe is the same thing as the Vietnam-era tiger stripe, only instead of the green, they put pink in there. Uh, 
So now my daughter is the proud owner of a Glock 17 that is completely finished in the pink Lady Amstripe. And uh, she, when she goes out to the range, when she goes to uh, do her little shooting contest and what have you, everybody has to shoot the pink Tiger Stripe Glock. Every- <laughs> and she also has, she's the proud owner of a watermelon pink AR-15. So she's got a watermelon pink AR-15. Oh, I forgot. She's got a pink shotgun, too. Yeah, she's got a pink 20-gauge semi-auto shotgun that she shoots clays with. So if you want to get a woman, you want to get your your daughter, your wife, you know, what have you, involved in shooting sports, and you want them to actually enjoy it, you want them to, to seek to do it even without you asking them to, because you know how, you know, wives and girlfriends are They're like, okay, I'll go with you just to shut you up. But, <laughs> you know, you want them to actually say, hey, honey, when are we going to the range? That's what I want to hear. You know, <laughs> let's go right now. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you know, and, and the, you know, the truth is just taking a standard gun and putting a little bit of color on it. That might be all it takes to uh, to make her happy and get her to want to go out and shoot it. So and Duracoat, uh, we'll put a link up for you guys. Duracoat dot com. I'll have Jared do that after uh, after we're done with the show. But uh, you guys can check out Duracoat and all the products that they have available. Oh man, I tell you what, it's, it's, it's been a heck of a week and we've got, you know, we just keep getting, we went from uh, a woman who gets choked and raped to this story right here. And this is a story that if you're, if you are a conscientious, responsible citizen in the United States of America, you need to know about this story. And if you haven't seen it because you've been, you know, taking care of business all week, this comes from foxnews.com. And uh, we had a British soldier, you probably have heard about it, but if you haven't, listen up. A British soldier was murdered in the street by two Muslim terrorists wielding a machete and a cleaver. In the broad daylight, middle of the day, they jumped this guy and they just started hacking him to death on a public street. And if that wasn't bad enough, this is in London. It was a suburb of London called Woolwich. But uh, if it wasn't bad enough that this happened, what was worse is that people just stood around and watched it happen. People... I don't even I don't even know how to address this. We've got a situation in London where the people have been so cowed, where they've been completely London people are completely disarmed. Uh, it, you can own, I believe, a two shot shotgun, but it has to be in a safe. The ammunition has to be in a separate safe. You can't even load it and put it by your bed at night because if you shoot an intruder, you're the one that's going to be arrested. Uh, it's insanity. And when this first came out, I, I had several, I had several gut instincts or gut feelings when I saw this on Wednesday. First is that, uh, I can remember, recall about six months ago after the Newtown massacre, the Newtown, uh, tragedy, um, how, I was on I was on a panel I was on a gun control panel online we and they had these British people telling me how uncivilized we were and how safe and wonderful Great Britain was since the people had been disarmed and they didn't say disarm they had said you know since the strict gun control laws have kept us safe and blah 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 well first of all that's bull crap British citizens are not safe and you've got our friend uh Piers Morgan who hasn't left the country yet even though those gun laws didn't pass yeah, we're, we're still waiting for him to get on a plane and go back home to merry old England. But uh, wh- why do we allow that guy to hang out in the United States and suck up our good oxygen? I, I think I think that is a question that we all need to look ourselves in the mirror and ask ourselves is why is that uh, piece of human debris still sucking up all the good oxygen here in the United States? But so you've got, you know, this, this and getting back to the, you know, my first thought was I thought that, uh, that Great Britain was this wonderful, you know, utopia that they'd been disarmed and therefore there was no more crime. There's no violent crime in Great Britain because the people have all been disarmed. <laughs> Guess what? No, bullcrap. There's a lot of violent crime in England. Well, there's not as much gun crime. 
Well, there doesn't have to be gun crime. If you're disarmed, a guy can rob you with a knife pretty easy. He can beat you over the head with a freaking baseball bat or a pipe. Uh, and guess what? There is gun crime in England. Oh, they don't want to tell you that. Guess who has guns? Oh, the same people that have dope. The same people that are thieves and robbers. They have guns because guns exist in the world. And if somebody can bring in heroin, they can bring in guns. So the only people in England that don't have guns are the citizens. Oh, and the cops on the street, too. They have to call special police officers. They have to call special armed units to deal with. Uh, I've always thought that was funny. You know, if you're a Bobby and you, you have, get a call for an armed robbery uh, on your little radio there and all you've got is a little radio and a handcuff pouch, what, what do you do? Well, hang on. We're going to send the special armed unit to deal with that. So we've got that. And, and I was just disheartened to read this story to see adult human beings just standing around watching this happen. Oh, and then what's even worse is they're just running their cell phones and the, uh, this uh, piece of human debris, this Muslim terrorist who just murdered a British soldier for no reason other than he ha happens to be a British soldier walks over and gives his freaking terrorist manifesto to the camera. And the woman just, you know, she just stands there, and everyone's heralding this woman as some kind of a hero. Really? They're like, oh, how brave it was of her to stand there. And what? No. Sheep are not brave. Sheep are sheep. And some of you guys are going to get asked up, and, and you're going to want to write me letters. But you know what? T.S., how have we devolved in the world that human beings don't even have the survival instinct to fight against a predator or to flee from a predator or whatever? A good friend of mine, he posted a comment uh, on Facebook. He said, what, nobody could find a cricket bat or a pipe or something to, to beat on this dude? I don't, I run him over with a damn car. Get in your little Peugeot or your whatever three-cylinder freaking things they drive in Europe. I mean, it's, it's got to weigh at least 800 pounds, right? Uh, run them over with your freaking car. But uh, no. And, and they're like, oh, well, the, these guys are crazy. They're bad people. Well, yeah, they are bad people. Guess what? They're bad people in the world. And disarming the citizens doesn't remove the bad people from the world. Uh, and while... And you say, so you might be sitting out there and you might be thinking, okay, Paul, I got it. This happened in England, but that's England. That's not America. That wouldn't happen or couldn't happen in America. <laughs> it's already happened in America, folks. A, a uh, Muslim immigrant hacked, decapitated. Was it one or two guys in New Jersey, Jared? I think it was two. Uh, it happened. Well, it happened in New Jersey, and the reason you don't know about it is because nobody was standing there on the street corner with a cell phone to take a, a video of it. But it's already happened. We had a Muslim immigrant in New Jersey who killed two people, decapitated them in the name of Allah just because. But uh, we're not supposed to know about that. We're not supposed to talk about that. But it's coming to America. It's coming to a theater near, near you, folks, you know, coming soon. Look at the United Kingdom. Look at Europe. Look at what's going on over there. That is a precursor to what is going to soon be going on here. And if you don't believe it, you're totally naive, and you should probably go listen to the Chicago NPR show, and they can tell you you know, how to be a good little sheep and uh, listen to the commissar. But uh, that's what happens when you are afraid to offend your enemy. Now, as a follow-up to this story, which make, makes it more, even more insidious, is you might think, well, these two guys, these two, uh, they, they came from the continent of Africa. I'm not sure what country in Africa they came from. I'm sure it's in the story buried somewhere. But uh, they're, they were uh, radicalized Muslims who screamed Allah Akbar as they were murdering this British soldier. And uh, why did they murder him? Because the British soldier had been in Afghanistan killing their uh, fellow Muslims? No. This guy was a member of the band. But he was in uniform. 
And what I used to tell my little kids uh, when I was teaching the military, I said, you, you guys think that the, uh, that the enemy, they just want to kill SF troopers and they want to kill Marines and so forth. I'm like, no, they get just as many Johnny Jihad points for killing you as they do for killing a Marine or a soldier or what have you. If you are in a uniform and you represent your country, that's good enough for them. And this, this poor guy, um, you know, his, his crime was getting up and going to, to work on base that day and then leaving base. That was his crime. That's why he's dead now. But uh, what makes this situation even more insidious is after it all came out, well, they had to admit uh, the MI5 intelligence that they were fully aware of these two dudes. These guys didn't just show up and decide one day to sneak attack. These guys have actually been involved in demonstrations and uh, anti-Western Muslim demonstrations against the West and the evils of the West, which is so ridiculously hypocritical, I don't even know how to address that. So you're going to go to the West and then stand on the street corner and talk about how horrible they are. Why don't you get on a plane and go back to the country you came from? Oh, because I can't get welfare there. I can't get all this free stuff there. I have to actually work there. Oh, okay, I got you. So, but yeah, they were fully aware of these guys. Uh, and you have to ask yourself, well, if they were aware of them, if they knew that they were radicalized Muslims and they're immigrants, why didn't they boot their butts out of the country? Is it because they're afraid to offend them? Are we in a position now? Ask yourself this, America. Ask yourself this, listening audience. Are we more afraid of offending our enemy than we are of our enemy killing us? If we're in a position as a nation where we're so afraid to offend that we put ourselves in mortal jeopardy of people wanting to kill us, we've lost. We've lost. The global war on terror is over, and we didn't win. Think about that for a second. We've spent a bajillion dollars and tens of thousands of Americans have been killed or maimed, permanently injured. For what? For what? We have Muslim terrorists living in the United States of America, okay, uh, getting government subsidies, planning our own demise. Read the paper. Look at the guys in Boston. Uh, Wake up, America. If you t I'm sorry to bring you down, but guess what? Ignoring the problem is not going to make the problem go, go away. And why is it that after these attacks, okay, the Boston attack, let's go back to the Boston attack. Uh, had our intelligence agencies been made aware of these bad guys? Did they know who they were? Did they know that they were radicalized Muslims and that they were potentially dangerous? Had they kicked them out and they came right back in the country? Yes. After each one of these attacks, we find out that, yeah, our government, as by our intelligence agencies and our law enforcement agencies, they knew who these guys were. These guys weren't hiding in a cave one day and boom, they just dropped out of the air and started attacking. No, we knew who they were. Why aren't we doing something about it? Ask yourself that. Why are we doing anything about these people? Is it because we're so afraid to offend that we've been cowed by them that we're afraid to say anything? We're afraid to do anything. We've, is our government, is the government telling law enforcement not to look at these people or not to get involved or not to deport them or not to? What is the what's going on, America? How is this happening? You say, no, that was in England, Paul. Dude, it's coming here. It's already here. It happened in Boston. It's going to happen again. It's just a matter of time because the weaker we appear, the better target we are. That's one thing that that folks that, you know, Americans, that citizens don't understand, that they fail to understand that showing weakness or showing a willingness to compromise or to bend over backwards or to when you are afraid to offend, doing that does not make the enemy seek to treat you better. In their mind, that actually makes you less of a man. You are a subhuman. You are weak and you deserve anything they choose to do to you. 
Think about that for a second. In the mind of our enemy, showing a willingness to compromise, being afraid to offend, or show, or going out of your way to not offend, that doesn't make you look good in their eyes. It makes you look weak. In their mind, you are weak. You are a dog. And anything that they decide to do to you is perfectly fine and justifiable because you're less than a man. You are a subhuman. You are an infidel. And you better get it through your heads because it's coming to a theater near you. Now, what is the solution? If you are listening to the sound of my voice, if you live in free America, if you are a responsible adult and you are not carrying a gun every day, all day, wherever you go, you're messing up. You're wrong. You're rolling the dice. And a lot of guys, you know, I've, I've uh, since this last week, people have, have seen this story and they're like, I'd have smoked that dude. Well, would you have smoked him? Would you have had the ability to smoke him? And, you know, we talked about how people talk themselves out of carrying their guns because they think, well, I'm not going to a bad neighborhood or I'm just going out in the middle of the day. You know, I can see if I was going out at night or somewhere, then I might need to carry my gun. But, hey, it's just the middle of the day. You know, it's a it's a public area because bad things never happen in public. Right, Jared? Right. You know, people talk themselves out of caring. They talk themselves out because why? Well, I don't want people to think I'm paranoid. You know, I want to seem reasonable. I want to be a reasonable person. Well, guess what? A reasonable person takes care of their own safety. A reasonable person doesn't look to others to deal with their problems. And like I said, I'm not talking about people that have genuine handicaps that need assistance. When I, when I see an adult American, a fully functioning adult American, and they have no capacity to defend themselves, I, I'm ashamed of them. Why would you do that? Even cavemen knew to take their daggum club with them when they walked out of the cave. And I don't care whether it's 2013 or not. We still have evil people among us. And disarming yourself or disarming the citizenry does nothing to remove the evil from society. How does evil flourish? Evil flourishes when good men do nothing. I know that's a paraphrase. But how do you prepare yourself? Well, number one, be armed every single day. If you own a firearm and you are not comfortable using it, ask yourself, why aren't you comfortable? Is it you're not comfortable because you haven't taken any training or you don't have the experience that you need? Look at your calendar, look at your time and available income and figure out how to get yourself into some professional training. Or if you've been to training, but you haven't been to the range for six, nine, ten months, get your butt out to the range and practice. Because when it comes down to it, you will only perform to the ability that you have mastered. If you've, you know, shot your gun one time in the last ten months and you think, well, in the heat of the moment, I'll know what to do. You're rolling the dice. Don't roll the dice with your life. You know, if you want to roll the dice with other things in your life, okay, fine. But when it comes to preserving your life, ladies and gentlemen, things are not going to change in the United States of America until every responsible adult in this country starts taking responsibility for themselves, for their families, and steps up. Because... I, I'm, I know I'm bringing you guys down, and I'm, I'll slow down now, but do it. So the moral of the story is, A, do not leave your home unarmed. If you are a responsible adult, if you live in free America and you go about every day unarmed without a defensive tool, shame on you. You are wrong. Now, if you live in an occupied territory, if you live in a state that tells you, hey, peasant, we don't trust you to be armed, you have a choice to make. You can either stay there and continue to complain. You can get with your fellow citizens and vote those turkeys out of office. And if you can't do that, well, rent a truck and move to free America. But what you, the worst thing for you to do is to just sit down in your living room and, and fire off, you know, you don't understand, poor me, I live in this occupied country. Or I love the, these guys that tell me, well, you know, it's not that easy. I just can't do it. 
No. There's a difference between I can't and it would be uncomfortable for me. Now, we have priorities in our lives. If your priority is living by the beach in San Diego, then great, rock on. That's your priority in life. But if your priority in life is to keep your family safe and secure and to not pay exorbitant and and punitive taxes, you might want to move to another state. It's coming. If you're not prepared, shame on you. Now, uh, before I let you guys go, I want to uh, just take a moment to really thank everybody out there in the audience for finding Student of the Gun Radio, and you guys have, have really been fantastic. This week, I think we've had more uh, more questions asked on the Facebook page than we have up to this point. We've had all kinds of stuff come in, and, and you know, it is tough. It's tough to pick one, just one question of the week or one student of the week. But uh, we do our best, and if a lot of times if we can't pick you as the student of the week, we will answer. We do our very, very best to answer questions uh, individually. Uh, we have done a lot of material. There's a ton of material on studentofthegun.com. If you go there, we have the weekly shows. We have the archives. If you go to the archive tab, uh, all of this season's shows are up there. Uh, you can watch those. We have the homeroom. If you go to the homeroom, those are a little short, you know, five to ten minute lessons. And it could be that some of the questions that you have or have already been answered uh, either on the homeroom or in previous material. And we also have the uh, the weekly blog article. We I do an article every week. And oh, this is a good time. If if you guys haven't signed up for the uh, the weekly newsletter, we do uh, a weekly blast. This is you know what is new at Student of the Gun. And we let you know what the the current article is, what's on the uh, the show this week, uh, what's in the homeroom segments. And we're not gonna, we're not going to spam you. We're not going to sell your addresses. But if you go to studentofthegun.com. Uh, up in the uh, the upper right hand corner, it just says sign up. You put your name and your email address, and then you have to verify it. And uh, it, some guy, some guys are like, "Well, I'm not getting my thing." And, All right, well, check your spam filter. <laughs> some some services make you uh, make you uh, you know unspam us or Marcus is not spam or what have you. But student of the gun dot com is probably the largest free training. Firearms University uh, online that exists right now. If there's another one, I'd like to know about it. But uh, every week we're putting up new material. You know, we've got the book, Student of the Gun, A Beginner Once, A Student for Life. We've got the Armed Living DVD. We've got lots of material for you guys to take advantage of. And uh, one of the things I do with uh, each week on the homeroom is I either do a recommended product or a recommended reading. And a lot of the reading uh, that we do has to do with being an armed citizen, being a prepared citizen, being a good citizen. So check it out. Uh, it's there for you guys. If you're listening to me now, I know that you know how to use the computer. So get on it. Check it out. Thank you again for joining us for Student of the Gun Radio. And remember, you are a beginner once, but you should be a student for life. 